I'm Nigel Forster uh, for the Photographer Academy. As you can tell, anyone knows the area, we're on uh, Pinar's Pier on a Saturday morning. So there's a fair number of people around. It's fairly busy. Uh, what I'm going to do is to demonstrate a couple of things. Firstly, on composition, how to find what we call the best point of view, exactly where we hold the camera, where we position the camera to get the effect that we're looking for from the image. And secondly, we're going to show, uh, show you the difference between the contrast between a long exposure and a standard short exposure. A long exposure has a number of benefits. And for any of you who watched my webinar recently on long exposure, you'll probably seen a few examples where I've, I've demonstrated the difference between the two. But we're going to use the opportunity today to, to, uh, to show you how that works actually on the ground. So, uh, first thing to do, uh, and as you see, there's plenty of people uh, walking up and down. One of the things about a long exposure is hopefully I'm going to try and get rid of those for you uh, in the nicest possible way. Um, so firstly, point of view, setting up the camera. I'll leave the filtration for a minute. So a um, few things to think about. Uh, firstly, uh, the height we have the camera and where we position it in terms of, you know, up, down, left and right. Now, generally, this is a very symmetrical shot. So with this kind of shot, pretty much absolutely down the middle. So what you're looking for is total symmetry either side. Anything off center, remotely off center, will, will, will stand out. Uh, so you do need to have a, a, an absolute symmetri symmetrical shot in this situation. Uh, in terms of height, what I'd be looking for is um, something quite close to the ground because in that situation, you're strengthening the perspective lines. The higher you go up, the more you, you're looking down on them and it weakens the perspective. So uh, I'm going to be looking for a low viewpoint. What I'm going to do though initially is to show you the difference between a higher viewpoint and a lower one. So I'm going to do that right at the outset. So there's no, fil no filtration on this. I will be adding a filter, firstly a graduated filter to darken the sky tones and secondly a long exposure filter, a neutral density filter to give me the opportunity for a long exposure. As you can tell, if there's a lot of people on the, uh, on the pier at the moment, hopefully they'll stay so I can show you how we can get rid of them all. I've got my camera set on spot metering, which means that the camera is taking its meter reading from precisely where I, I put the spot. Now, those of you who've done much work on exposure, and in fact I've covered in a previous video, is uh, about how the camera reads mid-grey. So, I'm taking my meter reading currently off the decking. The decking is actually slightly darker than mid-grey, which means the camera wants to lighten the image. So I will give it less exposure than the camera's telling me by around two thirds or one stop. I could take the meter reading off the sky, in which case I would need to give it more exposure than the camera's telling me because the camera wants to turn the sky darker, wants to turn the sky to grey. That sky is something between mid-grey and white. I can't tell you precisely, but it's something around that. So typically, if I'm taking the meter reading off the sky, I would be giving it more exposure than the camera's telling me. However, I've decided to take my meter reading off the decking. Uh, it's giving me 125th at F13, which, uh, let's take the shot, just to be sure, looks about right. So what we got there, those are all the settings I've, I've used. That's the sky tone on the right hand side, the highlights, and the mix of dark to middle tones is the various elements of the landscape element of the picture. I'd like to bet that, in fact, one of the darkest features on there, on the left hand side, the very dark tone is probably that person in the screen actually. It looks to me as though that's probably the darkest, darkest part of the picture. As long as you've captured all the highlights and all the, sh the shadows within the readable area of the histogram, then that's fine. So that's perfectly okay as an exposure. In fact, looking at that, I probably actually don't need to use a neutral graduated filter for this because I've got enough ski detail in the, in the shadows and the sky to warrant uh, taking, the pic uh, taking the picture without equalizing the exposure. If the sun was in that part of the, the image, the sun at the moment is way up in the sky to the right. If it was in that part of the image, the sky would be much brighter. I would definitely need a graduated filter. I might add one just to demonstrate it when we do, when we do the long exposure. Tell you what, I've changed my mind. I'll add one now, just to demonstrate the difference. So two sorts of graduated filter. One, a soft graduated, which has got a soft edge to it. Here, 
I think we're in a situation where, where I'm pointing the camera is by and large, it's pretty flat. Uh, mostly for flat horizons, you're better off using a hard graduated filters. These are quite strong, they're three stop. I, in reality, probably don't need anything quite this strong for this situation. So a two stop will probably per be perfectly adequate. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is place the graduation on the, on the horizon line then take the shot I had before. Now you can see, in fact, looking at that example, the problem I've got with the hard grad is that the line above the railing, where you've got the light coming through the railing, which is much lighter, the graduated filter is actually making that quite, very, quite difficult, simply because of the profile of the railing. So I'm wondering if I'm better doing this in post-processing rather than putting a grad on this. I'll drop the grad just slightly, see what difference it makes. Now, yeah, dropping the grad a bit helps. That was just to show you the difference between using a graduated filter and not using one. In this situation, I think we've uh, agreed that we can, we, can, we can get away without using one. So I'm going to take that off again. Uh, what I'm going to do now is to just show you just a number of examples where I've used different points of view with the camera. Now this is taken from about, well it's about waist high isn't it? Now this is roughly on equivalent with the height of the top of the railing. I could go very low, that will create a more immediate and more impact effect on the boarding, on the timber boarding. So if I just demonstrate that as well. What you can do with these, ca these tripods, uh, you can extend the legs. So you can get the camera quite a lot lower down. You extend them like that. And one tip about extending the legs like this is they're much better in wind. So if it's a windy day, then you can, you've got much more stability. You'll notice with these also, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this is made by a particular manufacturer, um, is that if you extend these legs too far, the central column hits the ground. They've actually got a way of overcoming this uh, where you take this all out and you put it at 90 degrees and it's all a little bit convoluted and it's a bit of a faff, but you can do it. Uh, I'm not gonna do that at the moment because I think I've probably got it low, low enough for, for the effect I need. So I'm gonna bring that as low down as I can. Yeah, the central column's nearly the ground. So I'm going to take the same shot as I had before. From a lower viewpoint. Doing around the sky tone, as I said, I've, I've taken the graduated filter because at the moment it makes it slight, life slightly easier. Now, at the moment, the main feature is that bench in the front. It's quite a prom prominent uh, part of the image. If I compare that to the last one, let's go with one with it, the, without the filter. I think that uh, image lacks a strong enough main feature and I'm wondering if we're better off going further forward and having the no fishing sign as a more prominent part of the image before taking the longer shot. So I'm going to pick the camera up, take it further forward and try a different, different position. Okay, I've moved a bit further forward. This is because I think on balance I would like to get the uh, the lamp and the no fishing sign, a more prominent part of the picture. I felt as though it was all on a level, it was all rather flat looking. So I want to get a more, do get a more dominant main feature in the shot. I'm staying with a wide angle lens to maximize the perspective effect of the boarding. It's a 16 millimeter lens uh, on a full frame. For those of you with a crop frame, that's equivalent to something between nine and 10 on a, a wide angle on a crop frame camera. Uh, so, that's 16 millimeters there, which is pretty much the widest that, uh, that, uh, that lens will go. So I'm going to set the camera up as we did before, uh, looking at the height and the relationship between the boarding, the bench and the lamp standard with the no fishing sign. Um, I think I want to give it enough height to create a strong perspective effect with the bench in the foreground leading up to the fishing, uh, fishing sign. So I'm gonna probably lift it up a little bit. 
but what I'll do, I'll try a high one, a middle one, and a low one, just to show you a comparison between the, uh, between, between the three. I will start off with a high viewpoint. Exposure reading should be exactly the same as last time. I nearly always use manual exposure, uh, which means that if the light level doesn't change, I don't need to change any of the settings I had before. So uh, I'm still on 125th at f13. The light level I don't think has changed. Looking at my meter reading, it's, it's within a third of a stop, so it's pretty much the same. If you're using longer exposures, you're better off either using a remote release because any, the moment you touch, even though the camera's on a tripod, when you touch the shutter release button, it can cause vibration in the camera. So I should be, should have been at all times using a remote release. An alternative, by the way, if you haven't got one, or if, you haven't, if you've uh, left it behind or left it in a bag somewhere, use a two second self timer. I'm gonna do things correctly. I'm gonna put the remote release in. Right, I'm looking at it, and I've not quite got this right down the middle. I'm just gonna change, change move it slightly. That's now, I think, perfectly symmetrical. One thing you'll probably notice now, which has become more prominent because we've moved the camera further up, there is some building works going on on the right-hand side of the pier at the top end. Um, so not an ideal time in, in that respect. Um, if you're gonna come down here, uh, probably wait until the building works uh, are finished, and I have absolutely no idea how long they're gonna take. So, three shots, firstly, the high viewpoint. We're looking down on them from above which isn't ideally my preferred option. Now I'm gonna to go to a middle height before I go to a lowest one. That will do. Okay, now the middle one. And I'll show you the comparison in a second. So I've got a, now got a direct comparison between the highest one which looks down on the railings and looks down on it quite a lot. The middle one and the lowest one, and the lowest one places much more emphasis on the perspective lines of the uh, decking. And also, um, I'm now not above the railings, so I'm now using the railings for a stronger, the top and bottom of the railings have got a stronger perspective as well. It's often useful uh, to look for wet days for this kind of situation as well. Uh, it picks out the, um, the wet surface of the decking quite a lot. Um, in that respect, a polarizing filter is incredibly useful because it, uh, it, you get a huge contrast between, between the unpolarized and polarized versions. Today, it's all dry, there isn't much of a contrast, but a polarizer will make a big difference in this shot. So uh, wet days with this kind of surface, whether it's decking, paving, or anything like that, are actually very good days to do it. And also try and look for quite a lot of contrast in the sky as well, because then you get some, some really interesting effects. Um, so, long exposure version. Right, um, for these, you need a neutral density filter. I've got two here. Um, one's a 10 stop, which means effectively it reduces the exposure by 10 stops from what you would have without this filter. So, uh, I was on 125th at f13. So effectively, I'd be translating 125th down by 10 stops. Now you can, um, you can do this in your head by halving it each time. So a 60th, a 30th, a 15th, an eighth, a quarter, half a second, one second. And you get, to, I think you get to 15 seconds like that um, with a 10 stop. That's a 16 stop. Um, try and look through that. Uh, <laughs> you can't see a thing. Um, so effectively a 15 seconds it becomes more like about, I think it's probably five, four or five minutes. Uh, so, um, initially, I'm going to try the 10 stop. Now, I pretty much know that um, 30 seconds at f16 will, on this, in light like this, pretty strong daylight will give me approximately the correct exposure. Two things about these filters. Firstly, you need to compose before you take the shot, because you can't see through the viewfinder. Secondly, you need to focus in advance, because the camera's autofocus won't work through these filters. It simply can't read enough information. So there are options on this. You either switch to manual focus, obviously do everything entirely manually, 
uh, making sure you're aware that what you're choosing, uh, what you're focusing on. And I'd normally pick a, a, a subject somewhere in the middle ground. In this situation, somewhere between the, the seat and the street lamp would give me roughly my hyperfocal distance. Um, so, manual focus is an option. Or you can focus using the back button. Now, I don't know how many of you have already got your camera set, set for back button focusing, but there are huge advantages with it. In fact, it, in my view, it should be the default on, on cameras, but it's not. Most cameras are set to focus on the shutter release button. So what you have to do is to de-link the shutter release button from the focusing function. So it's purely used for literally taking the picture and nothing more. Um, so uh, I focus using this button at the back. I can focus before putting the filter on and the camera will hold its focus and it won't refocus when I press the shutter. By default, cameras will refocus when you press the shutter. You don't want it to do that because it'll search. So options, either use manual focus or you uh, use the back button focus. And it might be an idea if I uh, demonstrate at some point um, on a video um, exactly where you find that on your camera. Of course, it varies between cameras, which doesn't help. Um, so, uh, regarding manual focus, by the way, most cameras have got a, uh, an infinity marker on the top of the lens. However, there are certain makes uh, of lenses. Do not put a, an inf uh, a, uh, a, a focusing distance uh, gauge or marker of any sort on the lens. It does make manual focusing a little bit difficult. Particularly is the important thing about manual focusing is that you don't go to the end because effectively they are designed to focus beyond infinity so that autofocus can calibrate. So you, in, in some ways you have to estimate where the, um, the uh, uh, infinity point is. You're best off, if you are in this situation, if, you, if you've got lenses that haven't got an infinity marker, use autofocus, focus on a distant point and then switch to manual focus. So it's, it'll hold that focus that you've chosen. That's normally the best way of doing it. But that's the last resort if you don't have an infinity marker on the lens. I've got an infinity marker on mine, so that's what I'm going to use. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm using back button focus anyway. So I've, I've already preset the focus. So um, I've now got my 10 stop filter in front. Uh, the other thing I need to do with my camera is to close off the viewfinder. Uh, on some makes, um, there is light ingress through the back of the camera on long exposures. Um, I've got a Nikon. It is a failing of Nikons that they happen to do this. Um, and um, if, you're a, if you're a Canon user, you're, you should be fine. So they've all got pros and cons, all these makes. Um, so uh, I'm going to close off the back of the viewfinder. I'm going to put a soft grad on because I think that'll, that'll help with that very dramatic line between the darkened part of the image and uh, the lighter area at the bottom because it seemed a very obvious line which might be difficult to overcome in post-processing. I'm just going to make sure I've got the, uh, the graduation in the right position in the, in the image. I'm going to knock about, I'm going to bring it down to f14, just take a little bit off. It has got brighter since we started shooting. So now we've got soft graduation which means it's actually, in this kind of situation, it's, uh, it's, it's worked much, much, much better. Partly because the brightest part of the image is actually high in the sky, not at the bottom. That's where we want the darkest graduation. That's the, uh, the image which has got graduated, and that's the, uh, that's the histogram. And as you can see, there's no highlights flashing, so that exposure is absolutely fine. Two things uh, worth uh, bearing in mind. Particularly when you're shooting against the light, do make sure your filters are spotless. Finger marks, dust spots, rain spots, smears, anything like that will stand out massively and much more difficult, they're actually much more difficult to keep clean uh, than lenses are because of the, the coating on the filter. As you can tell, there's a fair number of people on here walking back and forth, back and forth which, is, which is great because it's just what I want to illustrate. So I'm gonna go to uh, a longer exposure I'm going to go from 30 seconds to four minutes. That's three more stops. So I'm, I need to add three more stops of filtration, which means adding another filter. I do have a 16 stop filter, which means I could do it in one. I think 16 is a bit too much though. I think you all got, might get a little bit bored while I'm waiting to take a shot 20, 20 minutes long. Right, I've got a third filter here. Uh, it's a four stop filter, which I'm gonna add to the existing ones. This isn't ideal, by the way. I've got three filters on here. Now, in an ideal situation, 
I rarely want to put three filters on the front of my lens. Every bit of glass you add on to the front, you've got more likelihood, firstly, of diminishing image quality, secondly, of getting smears, smudges, what have you, between. So, um, so yeah, it is not ideal. Um, as I said, I do have a 16 stop, but I think it could be a little bit too much. I'm gonna put the graduated filter on the outside and put the other neutral density filter on the inside. So this is now gonna turn my 10 stop into 14 stops. Now 14, I had 10 stop at 30 seconds. Let me just double check. 30 seconds at F14. So this effectively will turn my 30 seconds into eight minutes. Think about it, 30 seconds to one minute is one stop, one minute to two minutes is two, two minutes to, th to four minutes is three, four to eight is four. Eight minutes is a fair amount of time. So I'm gonna open up my lens by one stop. That'll take me back down to four minutes, which is a little bit more reasonable. So I'm now on F10. I'm not worried about depth of field. Um, I focused on a, uh, on a midpoint um, and uh, the, the closest detail is far enough away for me to get that, sh uh, to get that bench sharp uh, at F10 so on, on, with a wide angle lens. So I'm gonna to switch to bulb setting because the presets on most of your cameras will only go up to F uh, to uh, 30 seconds. Uh, there are a couple of makes which go up to Olympus, for example, a one which go up to one minute, but most of them are on 30 seconds. So you'll need a remote release that holds the uh, shutter release in. Your cameras will uh, have uh, presets up to typically up to 30 seconds. Beyond that, it goes to bulb. Why they don't go beyond 30 seconds, most of them, I really don't know, but they don't. Um, so uh, you'll need a remote release which holds the shutter in. So that's precisely what I'm going to do now. I'm just um, putting the stopwatch on my phone, which means I can start the uh, phone at the same time, and I'm going to record a four-minute exposure. Start. So I'm going to give it four minutes. So here's our finished uh, image. You'll notice that the long exposure compared to the short one is vignetted quite significantly at the corners. It's the way that long exposures tend to work. It tends to increase contrast between, between highlights, uh, particularly towards the edge of the frame. So that's fairly typical. You'll also find that you'll probably have a slightly blue looking image. Typically, most of these long exposure filters tend to add a bluish cast, which you can correct in post-processing. It's not a problem. So what we've got here is a, uh, a long exposure where everyone's disappeared, all those people walking through the image. Short exposure where you can see people on the bridge, on the pier rather. What we've done is to uh, choose a variety of different points of view to show you how, what difference it makes in terms of perspective uh, and impact on a main feature and uh, used filtration to balance exposure between sky and foreground and also filtration in terms of being able to use longer exposures with a neutral density filter. Ideally, for the example I've shown you, need more contrast within the sky. As you can tell from the images I've taken, the sky is a pretty flat white. Therefore, even with, with a short and a long exposure, there's not much contrast to work with. So the results are gonna be fairly flat looking. Um, so ideally look for a, a, a day, more changeable weather, uh, more contrasting, uh, texture look in the clouds as well. Um, very little wind today. Typically uh, when you've got uh, white cloud and no wind usually you'll get days like today so what you're looking for is a little bit more wind, perhaps uh, um, weather coming from the west if I can make myself heard um, and uh, it'll give me more movement in the cloud. Um, the second thing is direction of cloud movement as well. Now we had our perspective lines running through the picture very strongly out of the image. Now, ideally, I'd be looking for wind direction to be coming towards or away from the camera to reflect the movement in the shape of the foreground. So think about your composition and how the cloud movement works in a long exposure, works within the composition. You ideally want it to reflect the form in the foreground. So it looks like a, uh, a, 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 a coordinated, uh, coherent, image and the sky is not acting against the, the image in the foreground. <laughs>